All right, so we t discussed yesterday, we just dis discussed the difference between the cell membrane and the cell wall. And we discussed, if I'm going back here, that the, the function of the cell membrane is to control what can enter and leave the cell. We could say that it's selectively permeable, whereas the cell wall gives, provides structure and support for the cell. All cells have a cell membrane. Not all cells have cell walls though. And here was a list. Plant cells you should know have cell walls. But algae cells, fungus, and many prokaryotic cells, which are bacteria, many bacterial cells also have a cell wall. So please keep in mind and remember all cells have a cell membrane. Make sure that's in your notes. All cells have a cell membrane because all cells need to be able to control what enters and leaves the cell. So cells exist in a liquid environment. That means that not that all cells are floating in liquid, but we're not floating in liquid. We aren't aquatic, but the cells inside of our body are surrounded in liquid. And that liquid, that liquid is usually water. So the cell membrane has to be able to regulate the movement, to control the movement of materials in and out of the cell. And we call that a semi-permeable membrane. Semi-permeable. So if something's permeable, it means it can pass through. If it's semi-permeable, then that means certain things can pass through and other things cannot. Does that word make sense to you? Semi, meaning kind of half permeable, partly permeable. <coughs> so the cell membrane helps to control what enters and leaves the cell. How do we predict what enters and leaves the cell? Well, that has to do with concentration. And concentration is a measurement of how much solute there is in a solution. So let's make sure we understand what solution means. A solution is made up of two or more solutes in a solvent. So a solute plus a solvent combines together to make a solution. What is a solute? How could you describe what a solute is? You guys tell me. What's the solute? Now you're all afraid to talk. Gosh, now I know how to get this class quiet. Just record. And then you're all... <coughs> what, what's a solute? Okay. It's the salt. Tell me. Okay, the substance... The substance that is dissolved. So for our salt water solution, it was the salt. The solvent, how would you define what a solvent is? How would you describe what a solvent is? Okay. So if we're talking about salt water, and our solute is the salt. What is our solvent? The, stuff, the, the, liquid. the liquid, the water. So we'll say the substance <coughs> that dissolves the solute. For example, the water. Have you written any of this down? Yeah. Yeah. Because you want to remember this, right? So if I'm making Kool-Aid, and I've got a pack of Kool-Aid mix, is the Kool-Aid the solvent or the solute? The solute. The solute. What is my solvent? The water. 
And my solution <coughs> is the Kool-Aid mix. Well, the whole Kool-Aid drink. The drink. Okay? Now, water we call the universal solvent. The universal solvent is water because water dissolves more solutes than anything else. And so we worked with a water solution in here, a salt water solution, but now we're gonna look at a sugar water solution. In a sugar water solution, which is like Kool-Aid, the sugar is the solute, the water again is the solvent. So we're going to look at this process of diffusion. And I want to know what you remember from your notes about diffusion. Is it, can it happen in, in a gas? Yes. Can it happen in liquids? Yes. Okay. So it can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas, and it's the movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. These brackets <coughs> mean concentration. So if I give you a picture, I've got two boxes here. And in one box, I'll call this box A, I'll call this box B. Which box has the higher concentration? A. 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 Because it has more particles in it, right? And in box A, the particles are going to be hitting each other more often. They're going to be colliding with each other more often because there are more particles in that box. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. The random movement of particles is something called Brownian movement. Particles are always moving. Atoms are always moving. Even in a solid, particles are always moving. It's because the particles that are always moving and bouncing into each other that they want to spread out as much as possible so they don't bounce into each other as often as they can. So if you're at a party and everybody is all in the same room, it's going to be crowded, right? <coughs> and so then somebody opens a sliding glass door to the backyard. Does everybody go outside? No, no because then outside it's going to be crowded too. So what do they do? Some of them go out and some of them stay in. And if three people go out, then maybe three people come back in until it's about even. If you're at an amusement park, does everybody go to one corner of the park? No. no. They spread out mm -hmm. until it's about even all around. What word do we use? Distribute. Okay, they distribute until we get to what point? Equilibrium. Equilibrium. Do you remember reading about that word? Yeah. All right. So, diffusion again occurs from a high concentration <laughs> to a low concentration. Because, see, it doesn't take any added energy for this to happen. This is a passive transport process. Because particles are constantly moving they are going to distribute themselves and spread out as much as possible. So this is a passive transport process. It does not require energy. No energy is needed to make it happen. This process of diffusion can be gas particles. It can be dye molecules in a beaker of water. It can be sugar or salt in a beaker of water. It can be creamer in a cup of coffee. It can be a fart in a car. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. That's meant to be funny. Okay? When somebody passes gas in a car, 
Does the cloud of gas just stay over their lap? No. No. It spreads throughout the whole car. That's diffusion. <laughs> and diffusion occurs until the concentrations are equal throughout the space. So hopefully what you do is you roll down the window so that it keeps diffusing out the window and you don't have to sit and smell it. <laughs> so on this website, phschool.com, you have an opportunity to earn some extra credit. If you enter in this web code, you will run in a simulation, do an activity about diffusion. And then you will answer 10 questions. Usually there's 10. <coughs> you have two options. Okay, you have two options. You can print the questions and then write the answers. Or if you don't have a printer available, you can hand write the questions, but you have to write out the questions and then you answer them. This will give you 10 points of extra credit on your notebook. So it has to be done by Friday, before Friday, because it goes with this notebook check. Yes? No, there's just two boxes. So you'll type in CBP and then 3073. Okay? So if you don't get this web code, it's on the PowerPoint. Yes? What page is that going in the notebook? Is that just like a piece of You do it on a separate piece of paper, and you can attach it to these notes. It doesn't really matter where it goes within the chapter because it just goes, the extra credit points go to this chapter. Okay, and there's another one coming up too, so I hope you're paying attention. Yeah. Okay, so this picture is showing us a cell and we're looking at outside the cell and inside the cell. <coughs> Where is there a higher concentration, outside or inside? Outside. Outside, right. So you got a higher concentration of solute here, a lower concentration of solute here. Notice what's happening in this first picture. There's nothing on the inside. What? Okay, in the very first picture, in picture one, there's nothing on the inside. So you know by diffusion which way the particles are going to move, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to go which way? Down. Don't say down. Into the cell or out of the cell? They're going to go into the cell. So notice the arrows are both pointing in. In picture number three, now it looks like if we counted up particles, they look like they're even. So we've reached equilibrium. What's happening? What kind of movement are we seeing in picture number three? Okay, good. So we're at balance. That's equilibrium. But in our lab activity, we're not necessarily looking at diffusion. We're looking at a specific type of diffusion. Okay, so these just describe in words what's happening, okay? We're looking at a specific type of diffusion, osmosis. So let's write down what we know about osmosis. Osmosis is a type of diffusion. Well, if it's a type of diffusion, why do we have a different name for it? It's just easier. Ah, it's the diffusion specifically of? Water. Water. So it's dealing with water. Water is moving in this case. Okay, that's what makes it different. Which direction does water go? It goes from high concentration to low concentration. So the water is going to move from where there's more water to where there's less water. So this is, does this take energy? No. no. It's a passive transport. Do you remember a sentence that you wrote down for the lab? What is it? Ah, where salt is. Water follows. Keep this in mind.
tomorrow when we do the lab. So I'm gonna pause here and I will finish recording my lecture after school when everyone's gone and then I'll post it. It'll take a little while to get it up on Google Classroom, but you will be able to um, watch it. If you did not finish, if you did not finish the saltwater article, you need to finish it. I turned mine in. Okay, so six periods left, and so I'm going to continue with this lecture for you guys so that you can listen to it at home, and hopefully the Sailor in the Sea Lab is going to make a lot more sense to you tomorrow. So we ended with this statement, where salt is, water follows. I want you to keep this in mind as we look at um, osmosis. So we said that osmosis is a type of diffusion, but we need a different name for it because we're talking about specifically water moving. This is a passive transport process, which means it takes no energy from the cell. It happens all by itself because you are moving from high concentration to low concentration. And the third thing that makes it different, different is that where water is moving through a membrane. So we're going to have um, through a, uh, a membrane involved. So through a membrane. And if anybody comes in, I'll pause um, the recording and then continue on. So those are the things that make osmosis different from diffusion, but still it's a type of diffusion because we are going along what's called the concentration gradient. So diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane here, as I told you in class, is your second opportunity for extra credit. So again, you're still going to phschool.com. You'll enter in this web code, CBP3075, and you will do a simulation on how osmosis works. And again, you will either print or handwrite. You print or handwrite out the questions and then you'll do your answers. And this can get you another 10 points of extra credit on your notebook. Okay. So here we're looking at osmosis. So we're going to be talking about the, the movement of water. We have a selectively permeable membrane that runs down through the container. And this membrane can allow water through, but the sugar molecules are too large to pass through the membrane. Okay? So the membrane acts as a barrier for the sugar molecules. Notice we have, we can call it side A and side B for clarity. And we have a highly concentrated solution of sugar particles on the A side. So I'm gonna use my little arrows, my concentration symbol. And on the B side, it's much less concentrated. So we would say it's dilute. Well, if sugar can't move through, what can? The answer is water. And our, using our sentence to remind us where salt is, water follows, we can predict that there's, since there's more sugar on the left side or on the a side that's the direction the water's going to go well you might be saying well wait a minute but what you said was where salt is and we're looking at sugar here that's okay because salt and sugar salt can mean anything that's dissolved it can be any solute so in this case our sugar is our quote-unquote solute and so wherever your solute is, water is going to follow. So because you have more, a higher concentration on the A side, the water is going to move where there's less concentration to where there is more concentration. <coughs> okay, water is going to move from an area, I'm sorry, of a higher concentration of water to an area of lower concentration of water. So the water is moving a, according to its concentration grading. And it's trying to dilute this side of the sugar. And as we go on in this lecture, we'll see over and over again, and, and hopefully this will become more and more clear to you. But right now, remember, these concentrations are referring to the solute. Okay? What could you say about the solution on this side? Is this solution more dilute or less dilute? Okay? This is a very dilute solution. Okay? And on this side, it's more concentrated. 
So again, you're going to have water moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And you see how it makes the volume, oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to write on it, makes the volume on side A of the cup, the volume increases, the water level goes up because the water is moving over. If you actually counted all the little sugar molecules, the sugar molecules on side A would stay exactly the same. So in this case, the membrane doesn't allow the sugar to move through. It only allows the water to move. So where salt is, where the solute is, water follows. <laughs> I'm All right, sorry about that, another interruption. Okay, so these words, hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. Pay attention to the prefixes here. Hyper means more. Okay, hypo means below, and iso means even, okay? So we are gonna be paying attention to the concentration of the solution outside of the cell. The concentration of the solution outside of the cell. So this is where I'm gonna go away from the lecture and I'm gonna draw cells for you. So I'm going to know those of you who actually are watching the video because you're going to have these cells drawn in your notebook. So here we have a cell and this cell I'm going to say is 70% water and 30% salt. Okay, getting back to our little cell here that's in 70%, it's a 70% water cell um, and that means 30% of that cell is salt. So if I take that cell and I put it into a distilled water solution, distilled water is 100% water. There's no salt in it at all. So my question to you is, where is all the salt? So if I take this cell and I put it into a distilled water solution, that's 100% water. Where is there more salt? Is it in the distilled water or is it in the cell? Your answer should be, well, there's more, water, there's more salt inside of the cell. And our sentence is where salt is, water follows. So which direction is the majority of the water going to flow? And your answer should be either into the cell, out of the cell, or equally. And have you thought about your answer? Where salt is, water follows. In this case, the water is going to go into the cell. The vast majority of the water is going to move into the cell. Yes, a little bit of water still comes out, but most of the water comes into the cell. So the next solution I'm going to say is I've got a solution that is 70% water, 30% salt. What's going to happen to the cell if I put it into that solution? So our first time our cell was put into 100% salt. Now I'm looking at putting in the cell into a 70% salt solution. I'm sorry, 70% water, 30% salt. What's gonna happen? Where is the salt? Well, the salt's even, it's 30% and 30%. So what happens? In this case, I'm drawing my arrows equal on both sides. So notice there is no net movement of water because it's at equilibrium. My third solution that I'm gonna put my cell into is now gonna be a solution that is 90%, no, I'm sorry, not 90. I'll make it, um, I'm just making up numbers here. So now I want it to be a 40% salt solution which would mean it would be only 60% water. In this case, where's my salt? Is it inside the cell or outside the cell? In this case, there's more salt outside of the cell. So where salt is, water follows. So now I'm gonna draw a really big arrow going out of the cell because the net flow of water is out of the cell but I still keep a little arrow going in because water's always going to be moving in both directions. It just needs to flow in one direction more. Okay, so now hopefully you know how to predict which direction the water is gonna go. 
Why is the salt not moving? Because the salt particles can't get through the membrane, but water can move freely through passive transport. So that's why our statement, our sentence, where water is salt, I'm sorry, where salt is water follows, I said it backwards, where salt is water follows, is so important. So now we wanna use words to help us to distinguish what kind of solution we have. So let's start out with the one where it's even. Which one was even? So I've, if I call this solution A, solution B, and solution C, which solution had the same salinity or the same concentration as the cell? It's solution B. And so this solution is isotonic. Remember, iso means even. Okay, so that's our isotonic solution. It's the same concentration as the cell. Now, our other two solutions would either be hyperconcentration or hypertonic, which has a greater concentration than the cell, or hypotonic, which is less concentrated than the cell. Okay, so which solution was less concentrated than the cell? It had less salt than the cell. Attention students, oh. whoever has a black... Sorry, another interruption. So again, which solution is less concentrated than the cell? And you should say answer solution A. And so what do we use? We, what term do we use? We say it's hypotonic. So solution A is hypotonic. It is less concentrated than the cell. So hypo means below, below concentration. And that leaves us with solution C being hypertonic. Hyper, because it's got more salt than the cell. So what if I had a solution, same cell, and I had a solution that was 89% um, water, okay? And that would be 11% salt. What kind of solution would that be? Well, where's, is it? Hypertonic, isotonic, or hypotonic? Is it the same as the cell? No, so you can rule out isotonic. Does it have more salt than the cell? No, the cell has 30% salt. This solution only has 11, so it's not hypertonic. It's going to be hypotonic. Okay, so this solution then is hypotonic. Okay? I can't tell you how many disruptions I've had trying to do this for you guys. All right, so hopefully if you need to hear this again, you can record it back or rewind it back and, and listen to that section over again. But I'm going to keep going with um, the notes and go on to the other sections. Okay, so we have here in words lots of... Um, videos that you can watch. Click on the links and watch the videos. I don't think the link's not going to work on the YouTube video, but um, if you go back and just look at the regular presentation, you can watch these videos. But these are all good to help you understand the difference between hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. And you should be able to explain the statement where salt is, water follows. Where salt is helps you to predict which direction the water is going to be flowing. Um, osmotic pressure is the pressure that the water is pushing on the membrane. And so in this case, in this tube, obviously the dots represent the solute and the solute can't get across the membrane. The water can. And so that's why if it started off at, at a, an even level here, if the water volume was the the same, the water has pushed down because the water is flowing across the membrane trying to rot, make this side rise up, okay? So the water level would have been pushing. That's osmotic pressure. All right, next, let's see what else. Um, where salt is, water follows, and this is what's gonna help us to predict what's happening with our sailor in the sea. So those terms, hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic, refers to the solute that's outside of the cell. And so here's some pictures. In a hypotonic solution, there's always less solute outside of the cell. Isotonic, equal amounts of solute inside and outside. Hypertonic, more solute outside of the cell. Again, those terms refer to the solution outside of the cell. Um, water is gonna be moving in both directions. And do you remember when we were looking at the pictures of the plant cells 
and we saw that the LOD cell was normal and then we put salt water on it and we saw it shrink up. Well, why? It's because all the water left the water vacuole and that was then a cell in a hypertonic solution. The salt water was hypertonic. If we took that plant cell and put it into pure water, we would plump it up and it would be in a hypotonic solution. And you can do this when you're with your veggies on your veggie tray because the water doesn't move in just one direction. So if you were going to make a really great veggie tray and you wanted to have really, really crisp vegetables, would you soak your vegetables in salt water or would you soak your vegetables in distilled water? Would distilled water be better than fresh water? Would fresh water probably work okay? Or would you need to use distilled water? I want you to think about that, and I'll ask you that tomorrow in class. Um, net movement of water, what does that mean? Net movement means the overall movement, the majority of the movement. Yes, you have some water going in and out all the time. There is some water going into this little red blood cell, but most of the water is moving out, and therefore the red blood cell is going to shrink when it's in a hypertonic environment. And we call that crenate. If your blood stays in an isotonic solution, then your red blood cells, nothing's going to happen because the flow in of water and the flow out of water is exactly the same. But if your red blood cells were put into a hypotonic solution, like a pure water solution, then your red blood cells would experience, yes, there is still some water going out, but the majority of the water is going to be going in, and that's why the cells will lyse, L-Y-S-E, lyse, and they might even burst. So this is why we can't take saltwater fish and put them in a freshwater aquarium, and we can't take freshwater fish and put them into a saltwater aquarium. And I want you to think about what would happen to a fish. If it is a, a fish that's adapted to living in a saltwater environment, what happens to it if you put it into freshwater? What's going to happen to its cells? I want you to think about that. Um, so this is just good reading that cells of large organisms are not in danger of bursting because they're bathed in fluids and the blood helps us to maintain that osmotic pressure. Um, but if you're a single celled organism or if you're a fish, you got to stay in the, the water that is the correct salinity for you. Now, switching gears a little bit, we are going to talk about a different type of diffusion, but again, this is still diffusion. So it's still passive transport. And my writing is really messy. Sorry about that. So this is still a passive transport, which means it does not require no any energy, no energy required. Sorry, I, I lost that picture. If I go back to my, here we go, go back to where I was having technical issues. Okay, so facilitated diffusion is a type of passive transport. Got to write it again. Sorry, I lost it. That means no energy is required. Again, why do we call it facilitated diffusion and not just diffusion? Because in this case, it's still diffusion, no energy is required, but in this case, we have protein channels that help to carry materials across the membrane. And we say that the protein channels are the facilitators. They're the helpers. So they help the process. Just like a teacher isn't there just to give you the information, we're to help, there to help you learn how to think, that's facilitating. So facilitated diffusion is a type of diffusion going from high concentration to low concentration but now we have to move across the membrane through a protein channel. And one of the things that is often moved across the membrane through protein channels is glucose molecules. And so here would be glucose molecules moving from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Notice there's more outside than there is inside. So this would be outside the cell. This would be inside the cell. And these glucose molecules have to move through using the protein channel. So this is facilitated diffusion. And because it's going from high concentration, there's going to be more glucose outside of the cell than inside of the cell. It's still diffusion because it's moving along the concentration gradient. 
okay? It's only going to be occurring if there's more of a particular molecule outside of the cell or on one side of the membrane than on the other. Active transport. This is our other category. Active transport requires energy. So your next question, explain how active transport is different from passive transport. At this point, you're probably getting pretty full on your notes. And so maybe you went to the next right-hand page in your notes, and you um, on that next right-hand page, you can continue with your notes. Maybe you divided it up into active transport and passive transport. Um, or you can do a new piece of paper on top of your notes so that you can divide it up. So in active transport, now we're not going from high to low concentration. We're now going from a low concentration to an area of a high concentration. So it's like you're trying to pack more particles into a cell. It's already crowded in there, and you're still moving more. I like to use the analogy of you have a suitcase that's already really full of clothes, but you just want to get one more outfit in the suitcase. Well, it's going to take a lot of energy, and you might be able to squeeze it in, but you're going to have to push really, really hard because you're going against the concentration. Clothes want to come out of your suitcase because it's so full, but you're packing more and more stuff into your suitcase. That's active transport. Did I skip a page? No. Okay, so how is active transport different from passive transport? In active transport, we can move molecules to an area where they're needed, even though there might already be some there. We're going to have to use protein molecules in the cell membrane. And notice, if this is outside the cell and this is inside the cell, Notice there's already one, two, three, four, five particles here, but only three outside, yet we're still pushing in. This is active transport because we're going from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, and it's going to require some energy. So these protein molecules in the membrane, ATP, which is the molecule of energy for a cell. ATP is going to open these protein channels and allow for these molecules to move on through. So there is your energy in your ATP. It opens up the protein channel and allows it to move through. We have some um, types of active transport. Remember, this is active transport still. And we're going to talk about two basic things, endocytosis and exocytosis. Endo, endo means going in, okay? And in endocytosis, large particles, even solids, so it could be liquids or solids, are going to move into the cell. How? The cell is going to um, be like Pac-Man. So I'll draw an old school Pac-Man here, right? The cell membrane enfolds, and let's say that this is the particle that you want to take in. So the cell membrane enfolds and grabs it and puts it inside of a vesicle. So you have the cell, you have the vesicle, and there. That's endocytosis. It goes into the cell. So think of Pac-Man. Okay? A pocket forms makes a vacuole within the cytoplasm, and it ingests. That's, it's going into the cell. There are two types of endocytosis. Phagocytosis, phago means eating, and pinocytosis, which means drinking, means liquid. And so in phagocytosis, this is going to be a cell. Maybe it's a white blood cell. And you have a bunch of bacteria over here. That white blood cell is going to extend its, its cytoplasm out around, and it's going to engulf that and put that, put that bacteria cell into its cell and then digest them and break it down. Penocytosis is going to be the same process. It's going to look the same, only instead of it being solid particles, it's liquid. Phagocytosis requires lots of energy. So this is showing you the process of phagocytosis. In this case, we have a white blood cell and a virus particle. And the white blood cell has little surface markers on its cell membrane that it uses to recognize the virus. It then engulfs the virus. And that's the first step. The second step, it puts it in a vacuole. And then lysosomes, the little digestive bags, 
that um, surrounds the virus and breaks it down and then excretes it as cell waste. So this picture is actually showing us phagocytosis, and it's also, which is endocytosis, right? And it's showing us exocytosis. Okay? And this requires a whole lot of energy from the cell. That's why cells need to get food. Pinocytosis, this is showing us taking in liquids, fills with the liquid. And then exocytosis, this is where materials are removed from the cell. I think these are pretty easy for you to understand, right? Endocytosis going into the cell, exocytosis exiting. The only thing you're going to have maybe a hard time is pinocytosis and phagocytosis. So um, the way I like to remember it, uh, pino grigio is a type of wine. So when we're looking at pinocytosis, if you think of, oh, my mom drinks a pino, a pino grigio, a pino is a wine, and wine obviously is a liquid. So the cells drinking a pino, drinking a liquid. I don't know if that's going to help you remember, but I'm trying. Okay, exocytosis. Ooh, section quiz. Let's see how you do. Unlike a cell wall, a cell membrane is composed of a lipid bilator. Does it provide us rigid support? No. Does it allow small molecules and ions to pass through easily? Yes. Is it found only in plants? No, because all cells have to have cell membranes. Concentration of a solution is defined as the mass of the solute in a given volume of solution. The solute, how much solute you have in a solution is your concentration. If a substance is more highly concentrated outside the cell than inside the cell, and the substance can move through the cell membrane. The substance will move by diffusion from the outside to the inside of the cell. Remember, that's just the net movement, okay? There's some that always goes back and forth. Movement of materials in a cell against a concentration gradient, against the concentration or gradient, is going to be active transport, and that requires energy. And the process by which molecules diffuse across the membrane through protein channels facilitated diffusion. All right, I hope this helps. This was a long one. Um, maybe the first half of it you didn't listen to. And so tomorrow when you come in, we'll finish up the sailor and the sea lab and we'll see what happened to our carrots. All right, have a good night, you guys. Bye.